welcome to new song. So great to have you guys here today. Would you stand up? Let's worship our God together. We believe that he loves us so much that he sent his son to die and pay for our sins. Let's worship him together this morning. song. I'm Kai and I serve in the worship and youth ministry here. God loves that you have come to worship him today. The more time you spend around God's people, hearing his word and singing his praise, the less important the things of this world become to you and the more of his peace and power you will experience in your life. The evil one on the other hand loves it when you miss church and don't receive the spiritual benefits that you get by being here. So good job being here and moving toward God this morning. 
If you are new to New Song this morning, we are so glad you are here. We consider those who are at New Song for the very first time VIPs. We have a team that would love to meet you at the VIP table in the lobby. Would you take the connection card that's in your program out there after the service? If you do, they have a gift for you this morning to show you how glad we are that you came. It's a book that answers the five biggest questions people have about God and a cool New Song tumbler. If this is not your first time to New Song, would you also please fill out the connection card? We ask everyone to do this just so that we can know you are here, be praying for you, and hear if you had a spiritual conversation this past week. You can drop those in the offering bags after the message. Hello to those of you joining us online today as well. Please fill out the digital connection card right now along with our live congregation. We are so glad you're with us online today. New Song is all about helping you and your family become fully devoted followers of Jesus. If you want to know what we have to help in that, check the program. It is full of events, groups, and services to fill, feed, and grow your soul so that you can become more like Jesus. Take a second to look through it to see what might apply to you. While you're doing that, there are a couple things coming up that we want to highlight. Ladies, Women's Connection is excited to bring the If Gathering to New Song on Saturday, April 27th from 9 to 1230. The If Gathering started 10 years ago to equip women to disciple a generation through a video conference of inspirational speakers that is now watched by millions of women in 127 countries. Imagine what happens when hundreds of women gather to be encouraged and stirred up in our faith together. And we get together locally here to be part of it. We're going to learn from some of today's most dynamic and diverse speakers selected from the live event, including visionary founder Jenny Allen, Christine Kane, and Sadie Robertson Hupp, to name a few. So whether you come with your best friend, your life group, or by yourself, you'll find a community of women who will embrace you and encourage you to be who God created you to be. Registration is $10 for adults, it's free for college students, and includes a continental breakfast. And child care is available for a nominal fee. You can register through the New Song website or app or at the bookstore. Doors open at 845 and our program begins at 9. So invite a friend, bring your Bible, and join us for a morning that promises to challenge, encourage, and inspire us in our faith journey. Registration closes on Wednesday, April 24th. So get your tickets today and meet us there. Hi, my name is Susan. I'm the children's director here, and I'm so excited to tell you about our second annual Spring Carnival. It's coming soon. This was such a big hit last year. We will fill our cafe space with carnival fun. We will have corn dogs, popcorn, snow cones, and cotton candy. And this is a totally free event. It's an outreach to our community. So it's a great opportunity to invite the unchurched families you know with children. We'll have a ball at the cakewalk, bounce houses, and playing carnival games. So mark your calendar, save the date, and start inviting your friends now. Friday, April 19th from 5 to 8 p.m. We hope to see you there. Before we continue in our service, let's take a second to meet some of the amazing people around you. The Christian life is so much better when we do it alongside others. We are here to help each other grow in Christ. So please stand up now and go make some new friends. If you sat, would you stand back up? We're going to sing. We're going to worship. We're going to give God praise and uh, connect with each other as we lift our voices to the Holy King. So let's sing together.
we believe and we trust. Lord, we know you and we love you. We worship you, the amazing, almighty, three in one, eternal, all-powerful God. Thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We worship you, Lord. Sing it together.
church and birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church.
Amen. Jesus, you are holy, and your name is holy. It's lifted high, and we are so grateful to be bearers of your name. We know that you've written your name on our hearts. You've taken our hearts of stone and replaced them with hearts of flesh, hearts that beat for you, hearts that can obey your word. Thank you, God. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, we're grateful that you are constantly reminding us of the words of God and applying them to our lives, convicting us of sin and encouraging us toward righteousness. We can't do without you, Spirit. Heavenly Father, we bow down and worship before you, the majestic one, the only God. We worship you, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's thank him again for who he is and what he's done for us, even already this morning. You may be seated. Yeah, great job, everybody. You know, I was thinking while we we're singing that song that um, I guess I should say good morning before I, I say that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a delight to see you all. Have I told you lately that I love you? Yes. Yeah, well, I do. Um, while we we're singing that song, I was thinking, you know, the angels cry holy. It's a picture in Revelation 4 and Revelation 7 and probably some other places too. But um, everybody's in the throne room looking at God. And, you know, if you've ever seen like a beautiful mountain for the first time or maybe the Grand Canyon, you can't, just can't help but say, wow, right? I think that's what's going to happen. It's just going to come out of us. You got to say holy to him because that's who he is. It's just going to, wow. Everybody say, wow. wow. That's the American version of holy, right? So, uh, <clears throat> you enjoying the rain? <laughs> no? <laughs> Some of us are Californians and we are. And some of us are not, right? I mean, if you came from Oregon, this is nothing. But uh, you, you do know it rained last night. It actually rained a little bit in, in the evening as I was coming home from something or other. And I was thinking, I have three grandchildren. They're playing football, baseball, two of them playing baseball. And, playing, and they got rained out a whole bunch this year because of rain. I've lived in this state for over five decades, and I've never seen it like this before. And I think it's a good thing, but you know, when it rains out kids' programs, it's a bit of a problem, right? I only bring that up because I thought it'd be fun to start the message by asking you to turn to somebody next to you and tell them about a problem you have solved sometime in your life. Doesn't even have to be recently. Uh, but that way we'll kind of get a mixer going and I know, I see there's a gap here, it's a little awkward. So uh, be bold and you know, if someone's, uh, never let anybody be alone, right? So turn to somebody, you each got 60 seconds, Tell someone near you about a problem that you once solved. Ready, go. Okay, make sure the other person get a chance to share too. Okay, sounds like most of you are done. You're all done. Was that fun? It's kind of fun to brag on yourself, isn't it? Uh, so, we got a picture here, Jan, uh, Cheryl. We got a picture of a bike. I want to tell you about a problem I once solved. I was, I think, seven or eight years old. I was in third grade, whatever that is. And, and for my uh, Christmas present, my parents bought me a banana bike. Some of you know what those look like? <laughs> yeah, there's a banana bike. Uh, real cool, you know, because like for a kid, the, the handlebars felt like a, a, a motorcycle. And it had a, I think it was called a banana bike because it had this real long seat that kind of looks like a banana, doesn't it? And then in the back of it, anybody know what that thing's called? A sissy bar. I have no idea why it was called a sissy bar, because who wants a sissy bike? But, but it was cool for doing wheelies. You could lean back on it and do all kinds of tricks and stuff. Anyway, I got this thing for Christmas, and, uh, and our schoolyard was completely paved. There was no grass on the uh, uh, schoolyard. So I, a couple days after Christmas, I called a couple bud buddies and said, hey, I got a new bike. L let's go play on the schoolyard. And so we did. Three or four of us were up there riding. I think everybody had a banana bike uh, of one sort or another. Uh, but so we're scooting around the, 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 
playground and the parking lot was right next to it. And uh, it, to cordon the parking lot from the playground, there was this little chain with a, uh, you know, a pipe that attached the chain about every 10 feet or so. Chain's about yay high or so. And at one point, uh, one of my buddies took his bike and scooted under there. It was really cool because, you know, handlebars are about yay high. And, and just when he got to the chain, he stuck his head down and went under. I thought, that's cool. And he was, and he was ripping. He was going full speed ahead. So I decided to do the same thing. <laughs> it, you know, it was only my first or second day on the bike, and I hadn't realized that the sissy bar <laughs> was a lot taller than I was when I ducked. So I'm going as fast as I can underneath, and for an instant I went, that was cool, and then the sissy bar hit the chain. And at that moment, well, not at that moment, about a minute and a half later, I solved the problem of not being able to get air. <laughs> this is the first time in my life that I discovered if you hit the ground hard enough, it sucks the wind out of you. I learned what that phrase meant. I still remember to this day, <gasps> <laughs> laying on the ground thinking, I used to know how to breathe. I can't figure it out right now. And I still don't know what the mechanism is, but I remember going, <gasps> and thinking, I'm about to pass out. And just about that moment, somehow my lungs relaxed or my throat or whatever it was, I, I, I solved the problem of getting air. Again, probably not the biggest problem ever in this world, but it was a problem I solved, and I actually had the problem one or two more times in my life. And I now know if you just relax, if you think about it, don't, don't work hard at it, don't, just, just relax, and eventually, before you pass out, you'll probably get air. I bring that up because uh, I want to talk to you today about solving the greatest problem in our world. Do you know what that is? It's not a natural disaster. It's not a humanitarian crisis. It's not political instability, and it's not cancer, although all those are horrible. Uh, right now in our world, you could say there are 345 million people on the edge of starvation. That's a problem. There are 100 million displaced people who have neither country nor home. That's a problem. On our five continents are more slaves today than any other time in history. That's a problem. Uh, but consensus among Christians is that each of those problems pales in comparison with the problem of lostness. Lostness. We, all human beings, were made in the image of God to have a relationship with God. And when we don't have one, we're directionless. We don't often even know something's missing, but something tragic is missing, something eternal is missing. Lostness is an eternal problem and it can only be solved while a person is alive. And today, here's a statistic for you. Today, life will end for 157,900 people who will enter a Christless eternity in a place that Jesus describes as weeping and gnashing of teeth. 157,900 souls will enter that place where there's no sense of God, no sense of purpose, no sense of progress, no hope for ever even having hope again, and another 157,900 will do the same thing tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. And it's not a problem we like to talk about, but you know what? It's not a problem that's gonna get solved unless we bring it to the surface and say, this is the great problem. Lostness is the exact reason why Jesus' final words before he ascended to heaven was, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You shall tell about me to people right here where you are now, people in the close by region and people all over the world. Remember that, Acts 1.8. Jesus' final words before he rose to heaven. This is the great problem in our world today, and it's the problem assigned to the church to solve. And we are the church. Y'all tracking with me? So I wanna share with you a, a terrible and then gets to be kind of fun story right out the, of the Old Testament. Would you turn in the Bible to 2 Kings chapter six? We're gonna start at verse 30, uh, 24 and it's on page 323 in those Bibles under your chairs. 
If you can do two things at once while you're turning there, also take out your message notes. If you can do three things once while you're turning there and you'd like to do some learning with me, pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, speak to me. Amen. All right, while you're getting there, uh, in the time of 1 Kings 6, Israel was at war with the nation to its northeast. The Bible called it Aram at that time. Today we call it Syria, which is sort of ironic because past Syria is the nation of Iran, and they just did something horrible to Israel yesterday, flew straight over Syria to try and bomb them. I'm sure you're all aware of that, and I'm sure you're all, all aware that the Bible tells us in Psalm 122.6 that we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I hope that's on your prayer list for today. Anyway, back to the story we're about to look at. Things are not going well for the Israelites in 2 Kings 6. And in verse 24, here, here's how Samuel, or excuse me, Jeremiah is probably the writer of 2 Kings. Here's how Jeremiah puts it. He says, sometime later, King Ben-Hadad of Aram brought all of his military units together and they marched up and laid siege to Samaria. So there was a severe famine in Samaria and they continued the siege until a donkey's head sold for 34 ounces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for two ounces of silver. You read that right, although if you look carefully, there's a little footnote next to it. And you, if you look at the bottom of your page, uh, it, it says uh, that that word dove's dung, what, what, it, what it doesn't say is it's a word that's only used here in Scripture, so we don't really, really, really know for sure what that word is. It could mean uh, two op options or seed pods or wild onions. So either dove's dung or seed pods or wild onions are selling for two ounces of silver. The, the point is, Things are terrible in the city. Can you see that? They're under siege. Things are bad and they're going to get worse. Verse 26 says, The king of Israel was passing by on the wall one day when a woman cried out to him, My lord, the king, help! And he, being completely helpless in this situation, said, Well, if the lord doesn't help you, where can, you get, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, which is where, you know, they got wheat, or the wine press. Uh, the king's really frustrated, but he's the king. So verse 28, the king asked her, well, all right, so what's the matter? And she said, this woman said to me, give me your son and we'll eat him today. Uh, then we will eat my son tomorrow. It really happens in sieges. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her the next day, give up your son and we'll eat him. But She's hidden her son. Yeah, war is horrible, isn't it? Verse 30, when the king heard the woman's words, he tore his clothes, which for a Hebrew is a sign of mourning. Then as he was passing on the wall, the people saw that there was sackcloth under his clothes, which is a further sign of mourning. Sackcloth under his clothes next to his skin. He announced, may God punish me and do so severely if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders t today. Who's Elisha? He's the prophet, the man of God. If you're gonna get mad and don't like your circumstances, you always blame the man of God, right? Around your dinner table, you say, I'm mad at Hal because my life isn't going well. Ho hopefully not. But sometimes people at least blame God, right? And that's what he's doing here. Things are bad in Israel and he's blaming the man of God. Well, skip ahead to the beginning of the next chapter, chapter seven, verse one. It says, Elisha replied in a different conversation, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow at Samaria's gate, six quarts of fine flour will sell for a half an ounce of silver and 12 quarts of barley will sell for a half an ounce of silver as well. Translated, 24 hours from now, prices will be back to normal. Now, how do you think that's going to happen? Think the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates so much that inflation is going to go away instantly for them? Well, here's how the story resolves for them. Verse 2, then the captain, the captain of the guard, the king's right-hand man, responded to the man of God, look, even if the Lord were to make the windows, were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? Elisha announced, you will in fact see it with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And here's the climax of the story. So now, four men with a skin disease were at the entrance to the city gate. They said to each other, 
why just sit here until we die? If we say, let's go into the city, <laughs> we'll die in there because there's famine in the city. Uh, but if we sit here, we'll also die. So come on now. Let's surrender to the Arameans camp. Uh, let's go out there because if they let us live, we live. But if we stay here or go inside, we die. I mean, it's kind of a binary choice, right? Die here or go out there, maybe die, but maybe not die. Uh, don't you like their kind of go for the gusto thing? Take a shot. We're going to die if we stay here. So the diseased men got up at twilight to go to the Arameans camp. And when they came to the camp's edge, they discovered that no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a large army. The Arameans had send to, said to each other, Whoa, the king of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to attack us. So they'd gotten up and fled at midnight, abandoning their tents, horses, and donkeys. The camp was intact, and they had fled for their lives. When the, these diseased men came to the edge of the camp, they went up into a tent to eat and drink. They picked up the silver and gold and clothing and went off to hide it somewhere. And then they came back and entered another tent, picked up all those things and hid them. And as they're doing this, suddenly, verse 9, they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. Today is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, our punishment will catch up with us. So let's go tell the king's household. The diseased men came and called to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went to the Arameans' camp and no one was there, no human sounds. There was nothing but tethered horses and donkeys and the tents were intact. The gatekeepers called out and the news was reported to the king's household. So the king got up in the night and said to his servants, I'll tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're starving. So they've left the camp to hide in the open country thinking when they come out of the city, we'll take them alive and go into their city. But one of his servants responded, please send messengers, take, you know, just five of the horses that are still left in the city. Their fate's going to be like the entire Israelite community who will die. So might as well go out and let them check that out. Send them and see, he says. Verse, 30, or verse 14, the messengers took two chariots with horses and the king sent them after the Aramean army saying, go and see. So they followed them as far as the Jordan River. They saw that the whole way was littered with clothes and equipment the Arameans had thrown off in their haste. The messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the Aramean camp. It was then that six quarts of fine flour sold for a half an ounce of silver and 12 quarts of barley sold for a half an ounce of silver according to the word of the Lord. The captain or the king had appointed the captain, the captain of the guard, his right hand man, to be in charge of the city gate, but the people trampled him at the gate. He died just as the man of God had predicted when the king had uh, come to him. When the man of God had said to the king, About this time tomorrow, twelve quarts of barley will sell for a half an ounce of silver, and six quarts of fine flour will sell for half an ounce of silver at Samaria's gate. This captain had answered the man of God, look, even if God were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? Elisha had said to him, you'll in fact see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. This is what happened to him. The people trampled him in the city gate and he died. Quite a story, wouldn't you agree? It happened in history, recorded by God's people, preserved so that we could draw lessons from it. I want to tell you this morning what I love about this story and one thing I don't love. This is where your message notes begin. Uh, I love this story because these four men realized when they got out to the camp that they knew, they know something that'll save their city. This is a day of good news, they say. It wouldn't be right for us to keep this to ourselves. We've got to go immediately and tell the people about it. Their realization strikes them so deeply that they don't even wait till morning. It's the middle of the night by the time they finish gorging themselves and realizing they've, they've hit the mother load. They're not going to exhaust this treasure chest between all of them and other people are starving. So in the middle of the night, they say, we got to go right now. 
Never mind what time it is, we realize we got good news that people need. Let's go and share. Second reason I love this story is because the four are no better than the other people. And you see that? The only difference between them and the other people is they know where to find the thing that will save everyone. In fact, you could argue that they're less than the other people because they're called diseased men. In earlier translations, before it wasn't PC, they were called lepers. They're social outcasts who aren't even allowed into the city, which is why they're in the city gate. The city gate's a transitional zone. Uh, there's a gate that goes this way, and a, or a wall that goes this way, and a wall that goes that way. So if the enemies break through, they've got to come in and around, and they can get arrows and boiling oil thrown at them from both directions as they're coming in. They're, they're in the city gate. It's no man's land. They're not allowed in the city because they're, they're lepers. They're going to infect other people. Uh, and they can't go outside because the city's under attack, so they're in the transition. The four men, I love this, decide it wouldn't be right to keep the good news to themselves. What we're doing is not right. You can read it in the text. If we stay silent, punishment will catch up with them. I love this story because the king is smart enough to investigate the good news. Initially, He's a skeptic, and all of us respond that way to to news that is contrary to what we already believe, because I believe what I believe, and when you question my beliefs, I always think, well, uh, what I believe is right, which makes what you believe wrong. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm not going to believe that, but this guy, the king, has enough integrity to say, well, why not investigate anyway? Because the stakes are so high, it's worth having my beliefs disproven. I like that the king is smart enough to have people investigate. So he does it and he doesn't wait. He assigns some of his most precious final resources, a couple horses and chariots and probably some of his best men to go investigate. He pushes back, but then he says, okay, I I like that a lot. Uh, One thing that I don't like about this story is that it implies or it actually illustrates that some people will never receive the good news. Captain of the guard is trampled to death because he got in the way of God's plan to rescue God's people. Some people will never receive the good news. The second to last thing I like about this story is uh, God did what people thought was impossible. You like that too? God did what people thought was impossible. The captain says, you know, if, even if God opened a window from heaven, how could food like that get to us at that kind of price? but it did. And, and, you know, you could have scripted a hundred ways before I read this story to you, how how they could be rescued. I bet you wouldn't have come up with this one, that four lepers discover a deserted camp of Arameans who have plundered a whole bunch of other cities. So they not only have enough provision for themselves, they got all the riches of those other cities too, that are now available to the people of Samaria. Quite a story. And the final thing that I like about this story is uh, when the word of God came to the man of God, an unlikely group of people was used by God to rescue thousands. Read any leadership book and they will tell you that, you know, the the proper thing is for a person of high character, probably high intelligence, probably lots of resources to lead the charge in doing whatever the change is or whatever the solution is, right? This is a story about people with no resources I don't know what their intellectual capacity was, but their social capacity was below zero. They were outcasts. Again, if you were to write the story, you'd say probably the king himself would figure out the solution or the captain of the guard. Uh, The king is, you know, kind of a neutral character in the story and the captain of the guard is a dead one, a skeptic who dies for his lack of belief. Who are the heroes in this story? They're the lepers, the diseased people. Four lepers changed the lives of an entire metropolitan area. I like that. And I like one more thing that's not shown in the story, but I'm pretty sure actually happened because this is a story rooted in history. It really happened. If you think about this city of thousands of people, the largest city in Israel at the time, chances are those four diseased men had relatives in the city, don't you think? So not only did they save the whole city, they saved probably their wives and children, their family and friends, 
They saved the people that they loved along with probably people they didn't know. Don't write that down because it's not in the story. Uh, But that's what I think happened. Friends, two months ago, we launched into an initiative that we're calling Your Kingdom Come. We're calling it that because we believe that God wants us uh, to increasing measure cause his kingdom to come and his will to be done in the city and the surrounding cities in which we live. I thought about this as I was reading this story and uh, I developed six what I want to call we believe statements that should be and I hope are convictional for us as a church. Can I tell you these six that aren't on your notes? Some of you are open to that. Uh, We believe that when unlikely people come to understand that God has given them an inexhaustible camp full of riches, that those riches ought to be shared. Number two, we believe that we don't have to be super Christians or super talented or super wealthy to be able to be used by God to help people who are dying discover that there is a place just outside their comfort zone where they can find eternal food. Number three, we believe that God wants everyone to be part of his forever family. Number four, and we believe that God wants lepers like us to share the good news with them. Number five, we believe that the news we have can change every man, woman, boy, and girl who hears it. And number six, we believe that the way to change a city is one life at a time. One life at a time. And then I thought some further and I thought, I might be the only one who believes this, but I came up with some I believe statements that I'm hopefully that you believe as well. But I'll just speak for myself here for these next few minutes. I believe, and I hope you do too, that the greatest problem in this world isn't the war in Israel or the war in Ukraine, though those are terrible but that the war inside the human heart that keeps a person from knowing their Lord and Savior is the greatest problem of all time. Further, I believe that the greatest problem isn't poverty, but solving the poverty of the soul. People are starving to death spiritually, which is why they feel lonely or depressed or dissatisfied with their lives and their circumstances. I believe that the greatest sickness isn't cancer, which shrinks or which grows cells too fast, but but sin which shrinks character and hope, which causes people to shrink away from God and leaves them feeling purposeless and empty. I believe that the cure for sin is the love of God accepted into a human heart, which starts to then breathe new life, new hope, new joy, new purpose, a sense of forgiveness and all the benefits of Almighty God into anyone who will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who came to earth to pay for our sins with his own life and then held out his hands and said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I don't just believe that. I know that. I know it because it happened to me and I've watched it happen to hundreds of people whom I love, many of whom are in this room right now. Now, I believe that I'm one of those diseased guys who just happened to be graced by God with the discovery that he's made provision for me and for us. And I believe that everyone I know in this room is one of those diseased guys too. Father, may your kingdom come. May your will be done in our lives like it is in heaven. Your kingdom come has four pieces to it. The first piece is that all of us unlikely people we'll each do whatever we can to help someone hear and embrace God's good news, the unspeakably great news that Jesus Christ has made provision permanently for each one of us. And friends, my not so secret hope is that sometime within the next two years, every one of us would have the privilege of seeing someone in our relational orbit come to Christ. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I, I, I want this because I want every person in our city to come to Jesus. But honestly, I want this because I want it for you. Uh, there's a place in the New Testament, smallest book in the, in the New Testament is called the book of Philemon, which is a really weird word, but if you lived back then, you would know someone named Philemon. In Philemon 6, 
The Apostle Paul says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You read that, and when you think about it, apparently, unless we're active in sharing our faith, we're missing some sort of wonderful aspect of Jesus. And I don't want any of you to miss any of that. And you know, in this room are dozens, if not hundreds of miracle stories. <laughs> if you've received Jesus, you know what that miracle looks like. Stories of a life that was lost, that became found and known by God, and, and that changed the person's dire direction, their trajectory. And just looking around the first couple rows, I see a couple dozen miracle stories, right? I mean, you carry it in your heart. It happened to you. Friends, everyone who experiences Jesus, who, who invites him into their life, experiences a miracle. If you've experienced the miracle, you know what I'm talking about. And I want you to be part of that miracle. I want you to be there when that friend raises his hand in, in church or where that uh, friend uh, says, I'll pray that prayer with you over coffee at Starbucks or however it happens. I want you to be there. I want you to know that person. And I know a lot of you have had that happen before, but man, let's do it again. Let's do it again, because this is a day of good news, and we can't keep it to ourselves. I want someone in heaven to say to every one of you someday, thank you. I'm here in part because of you. I think the greatest words we'll ever hear are from Jesus when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. But I think probably the second greatest words are you're just walking around those golden streets and you bump into someone and he says, are you? You're the person who, thank you. I'm here in part because of you. It'd be a great moment, wouldn't it? I'd like you to hear it a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. I'd like to be in the room when we all get to celebrate someday, and I think we'll have time to do that because eternity is a really long time. And the flip side of it is, if they don't hear that, eternity is a really long time. So we've started a new series this morning. You can see it on the outside of your program. It's called, Who's Your One? Bill Bright, uh, the founder of Campus Crusade, felt God call him to reach the campus of UCLA years and years and years ago. And Bright thought really hard about how he was gonna reach all those thousands of college students and decided the only way he could do that is if he started with one. And today, Campus Crusade, now called Crew, has ministers on almost every campus and almost every university around the world and have led millions to Jesus, but it started with one. You can't reach two until you reach one. You can't reach 10 until you reach one. You can't reach 100 until you reach one. So who's your one? Here's our three goals for this series. You ready for this? Goal number one is that each of us would commit to bringing an unchurched person to church with us in 2024. Uh, come and see is the phrase you use, you know? Or have an Arlene Pelican come. If you want help with your children, come and see. That'd be an easy ask, oh, except that we just did that one. But we'll have some more. I'm, I'm working on a, a world-class triple jumper, a Olympic champion triple jumper. If I can get him to come here, we'll have him come during or right after the Olympics. That'd be an easy time to come, wouldn't it? Actually, you, you know, there's 52 really good times to come to church every year. You know that? Sometimes they're easier than others, like Easter or Christmas, but anyway. So that's one goal. And many of you have already done that because we're three months in. You've had a friend with you. I had seven friends here on Easter and now I'm praying that they come back. And if you're one of them and you're in the dark part, I can't see you. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, a second goal for this um, series is that each of us would, would walk through uh, this little devotional guide that was put together by uh, a, a group in Nashville. I didn't write it. Uh, usually Scott and I write the thing we do uh, in September, the churchwide campaign, but this one came to us care of the North American Mission Board. And, and did you get one on the way in? Uh, just uh, 30 days of reading or 40, 40 days of, of reading. And it's really pretty simple. There's one verse and two paragraphs. Will you do that with me? There, there's some power in knowing that we're all going through the same thing. And this didn't cost us much. We just ran it off on our copy machine. So um, okay, so a lot of you signed on for that. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna start, right? 40 days of this. 
Uh, and then the third goal is that each of us would attend the spiritual conversations class sometime in 2024. We may do two of them, but we know that we're gonna do one and that starts April 28th. Two weeks from now, one of my favorite words, a fortnight from now. And we're gonna try something we've never tried before. Uh, instead of doing it like on a Tuesday night or something like that, we just said, what if we packed everything into Sunday morning? So you all are here at the nine o'clock service. At the 11 o'clock service in the venue room, we'll, we'll hold the class. It'll be a three week class, spiritual conversations, you know, how to authentically, not pushy or any of that sort of thing. Have a conversation with a friend. It's gotta start with a conversation. Uh, so hopefully two weeks from now, you'll stick around and head into that room, maybe get a cup of coffee in between. Uh, and we've made arrangements so kids can be in promised land for two hours for that period of time. Y'all tracking with me? I, I hope you'll do that. And we'll probably do it one more time before the end of the year, but I can't promise when. So, you know, get it while it's hot. Bring someone with you to church this year, read through the devotional and attend the spiritual gifts class. We, we, we do that in the spiritual conversations class. Okay, I see some heads, good. Uh, you know, uh, a, a few months ago, uh, a brother in our church wrote on his connection card, my sister is sitting next to my family today. Praise Jesus. He'd been praying for that for several years. And his next sentence was, now Jeff's on my heart to come to Christ. Pray for Jeff's heart. Uh, I took that connection card and I transcribed every word of it because I thought that's the story of God's people. My sister's sitting next to me in church and you know, she received Christ the week before is why he wrote that. And now my heart is turning to Jeff. My sister is one and now I'm going for another one. Do you know if every one of us had a friend come to Christ this year and then that friend led someone to Christ next year and so did we, if we did that every year, over the next seven years, every person in Oceanside would know Jesus, even if no other church did anything. That's the power of one upon one upon one upon one. So I'm praying that that might happen. Will you join me in that? Bow your head. And while your heads are bowed, if you're here today or on, online and kind of new to God, Jesus, Christianity, the Bible and all that stuff, I've got a sincere question for you, which is this, would you like eternal life? Would you like to have a relationship with God? Would you like to have all of the junk you're carrying, all the wrongs you've ever done that you know, come up in your mind from time to time, forgiven and wiped clean? And would you like to have what the Bible calls peace that surpasses all comprehension? And if you do, the good news is you can have it. It will begin for you 30 seconds from now if you'll just ask Jesus to give that to you. He is here and he is inviting you to receive his free gift of salvation, a life in relationship with him. All you need to do is ask. And if you don't know the words, hear the words. If you would like Jesus today, Pray these words under your breath and your life will begin to be transformed by him. Here are the words. If you want Jesus, say, Jesus, I want you. I want you in my life starting right now. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, which simply means I've done things wrong and I need some help. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I invite you to be mine. Come into my life and live your life through me and I will live for you for the rest of my life. And then say in Jesus' name, amen. And look up here and if you prayed that prayer, wave your hand at me because you want to acknowledge what you just did before it wears off on you. And I got to admit, it's pretty dark in this room so I can't see two thirds of you, but I see your hand and I love that you're waving at me and welcome to the family of God. There's some other dark pockets. Anybody else raising their hand? Uh, wow. So that's one. Who's your one? Uh, I, I don't know if you were brought with a friend, but we're really glad and Nikki's talking to her right now. So, you know, one of the things we're committed to is not simply a raising of a hand and a praying of a prayer, but a, a life continuing with Jesus. And so uh, when someone comes to Christ around here, we help them grow, help them learn how to continue to walk 
and all that sort of stuff. So do you like the, the, the story? Not my story, but God's story of the four lepers. And we're gonna ten, sp- spend three minutes now in twos and threes uh, doing a second discussion. You started with a discussion, you know, how cool you were when you solved some big problem or little problem. Here, here's your two questions. And again, you only got three minutes. So uh, go quickly and make sure everybody gets to share. Uh, question number one is, what'd you like about the story of the four lepers? N- not about how Hal told it, but the story itself. What'd you, what'd you like in that story? Uh, and then two, who in the city would you like to share the good news with? Got three minutes. I think Cheryl will put up a countdown clock. Make sure you don't leave anybody out. Put in a breath minute if you need to. Ready, go.
last year, and it was really fun. If you're wondering what that's like, uh, think about our Halloween festival in the parking lot and bring your kids and friends and all of that. It's a celebration and a, another excuse to invite friends to come and experience God's people. 5 p.m., 10 a.m., got it all? Uh, he really does reign above it all, right? And, you know, the Bible gives a lot of descriptors of God as a male. He's, he's our father. Uh, he, he's the Lord. He's the king. But there's one description of God as a female. The, the feminine side of God is he's a mother bear. And that's how he feels about you. When you're in trouble, he's a mother bear. So when you get up tomorrow morning... Just say, good morning, Lord. Uh, thank you that you are guarding me all day long and then live like it. Amen? Amen. Uh, I love you all dearly and God loves you even more. See you this Friday and next Sunday morning.